The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. From wherever you are uh, this morning or whichever part of the day you are uh, participating in our service, uh, know that you are welcome. Those of you who gather here uh, on a regular basis when we are not in a pandemic, but also very much welcome are all of you who are gathering from your own spaces um, across the state, the country, the world. Know that uh, all are welcome here. If you didn't get an opportunity to see the news flash this week or had not, did not know, we are celebrating communion today. And so if you have not gathered uh, any elements uh, in the midst of those that you are worshiping with, uh, I would press pause on this recording and uh, gather some bread and juice or wine, or whatever you might have. It could be saltine crackers for that matter and, and um, fruit juice or something like that, but just something that can um, symbolize the fact that we will be uh, later in the service enjoying this sacred feast together. Our guest preacher this morning, our presenter of the word, is uh, Aaron Guzman, who is a member of this church and whom this church is sponsoring on her way to ordination in the Presbyterian Church USA. Uh, Erin works for the College of Worcester. She is the interim director of spiritual, religious and spiritual life and the Interfaith Campus Ministries and also serves as the interim chaplain uh, to the college. And uh, we welcome Erin and look forward uh, once again to hearing uh, what she brings to us uh, from the sacred texts. Uh, there is no flower dedication uh, this morning, but I do want to remind uh, all of you that you may dedicate flowers in remembrance or honor of someone you know and love. And you do that by contacting us through the website or calling the church office. Uh, you can order from a florist in town and they'll be picked up for you. Uh, unless you happen to be in town and you feel like dropping them off, we can make arrangements for that. So in lieu of dedicated flowers, um, I've brought in some sunflowers. I, those, of, uh, those of you who have been here in Northeast Ohio for this summer, we all can give thanks for how much beautiful sunshine we've had. And so I thought this morning we'd bring a little sunshine into our sanctuary. And now let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning. Our service music today comes from two Russian composers. First of all, Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, 19th century Russian composer, famous for his ballets in particular. Uh, the piece you'll hear today is a slow movement from his first string quartet. And if you're my age or older, you may recognize the Volga Boatman song which appears in the melody for this particular piece. Although this piece was written for strings, it survives very well in this beautiful transcription for organ. Although it's not a sacred piece, you'll notice that the very final cadence matches our Amen cadence that we use in church. The other two pieces are both by Reinhold Glier, the next generation of Russian composers, who in fact lived until 1956, the two works in the musical offering and the postlude today are both from his set of six morceaux or morsels, small pieces, for uh, two pianos, two players. I'm very pleased to have my friend Claudia Thompson joining me at the keyboards today. Thank you.
invite you to join me in our call to worship. When our spirits are restless and unsettled, when peace is nowhere to be found, the grace of God wraps around us. We do not rush through periods of darkness, but welcome their gifts that transform. In seasons of despair, truth comes to wrestle with us. In silence, honesty voices its concerns. From the unknowns that surround, possibilities emerge. Courage calls us to linger patiently in discomfort. In the light of day and the dark of night, God is with us. Thanks be to God who upholds us in love. Let us give thanks and join our hearts, heads, and voices in worship this day. Let us pray. Holy Agitator, come and wrestle with our hearts. Push and pull on our self-understandings. Challenge our perceptions that confine and confront our thinking that leads us to harm. Meet us in the places deep within and let your spirit lead us in truth and healing. Amen. Please join in our prayer to confession. As we gather here today, forgiving God, we confess to you and to one another that we have not always lived as people graced with abundance. We confess the many small and large ways we have hoarded our time, our friendship, our resources, and our love. We confess the ways that we have avoided and stifled abundant growth by silencing those whose visions and thoughts might not agree with our own. We confess the ways that we have narrowed your mission by making our churches, our schools, our places of work inaccessible to those whose ways are not our ways. Forgive us, we pray. Open our hearts to receive and offer your generous love. Gracious God, hear our prayers. Amen. Hear this good news of grace. God comes searching for us, calling us by name, leading us into a, the peaceable kingdom. In Christ, we become new people. Broken, we are made whole. Lost, we are found. Forsaken, we are restored to new life. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. Hello, we are heading into week two of our Compassion Camp VBS. And I wanted to keep on that compassion theme. And one of the Bible stories that came to my mind about Jesus showing compassion to others is the story of him feeding 5,000 with not very many loaves of bread and not very many fish. But he is able to show compassion to all of those people that are there by feeding them. And so it made me think, what are some ways that I can show compassion right now? How well, Compassion is a big word for helping people feeling their feelings sometimes. And how can I do that? How can I help people? So I thought I'd just share some simple things that I thought we can do right now. One way to help people is to wear our masks. That helps people. Another way we can just reach out to people and send them a card, just a thinking of you card doesn't have to be anything fancy. You can make your own card and send a card to somebody just saying, I'm thinking of you. I hope you are doing well. Something else you can do is make a meal for somebody. Don't give them an empty casserole dish. That's not fun. But maybe make a pan of brownies, make a casserole, make some soup, hand it, give it to your neighbors. 
Something else that's really simple that we don't do very much of anymore is call somebody. Pick up the phone. Call your grandma. See how she's doing. It's hard to visit people right now. So just call somebody. Pick up the phone and call somebody. So I wonder, what are some ways that you can show compassion to people? How can you share the love of Jesus in simple ways right now? So what I would ask you to do, and this is for all anybody watching this video, not just our children and youth, but I would love to see you send us a picture of where you are showing compassion throughout your day. It doesn't have to be a lot of stuff. <clears throat> Maybe you bring up your neighbor's mail. Maybe you sit on the front porch and just wave to people as they walk by. Maybe you make dinner for somebody. Maybe you call somebody. Maybe you just do a simple thing like wearing your mask to keep other people safe. So I hope that you will put, um, send your um, pictures to the email address below and show us how you are showing compassion these days. Have a great week. Our reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 32, verses 22 through 31. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. This is one of my favorite stories from the Hebrew scriptures, 
and when I saw it come up in the lectionary for this week, I knew I had to come back to it. And when I say come back to it, I mean that this text is one that I used for my very first sermon that I wrote in my very first preaching class at Vanderbilt Divinity School, which was taught by noted Presbyterian homiletician John McClure, who was mentored by one of the great homileticians of our time, Thomas Long. I pulled out that first sermon this week as I was meditating on this text and I had a really good laugh at how much I've grown as a writer and a preacher since then. If you haven't ever tried rereading something you wrote years ago, I invite you to do that from, from time to time if you dare. I couldn't help but read myself into the story of Jacob, the one who wrestles an angel or a god or some strange man the text is never exactly clear on who it is. I thought about all the ways in which I've wrestled as a young person, but especially over the last six years or so, and how for so long I tried to run away from this calling to be a chaplain, to sojourn with others in difficult spaces and moments, and a, as a person who tries to speak truth in love with the hope of inspiring action for justice making. I thought about everything that's brought me to here. And though there is much gratitude for that journey, there has also been much grief. I imagine that's true for most of us as we reflect on our stories of growing and becoming. Where there has been struggle, there has also been growth and change oftentimes coming at the expense of something important to us. Many scholars have noted the similarities between this story and others found in Mesopotamia and ancient Near Eastern literature. Some think that this story found its way into the Genesis corpus through the adaptation of other myths or stories that also involved a man crossing a river and who battled a water spirit or demon. In those stories, a nocturnal being wrestles a man until daybreak, when the man then begs the spirit for a blessing and for safe passage. The characters in question may not have been named Jacob, but the story was likely grafted in to fit with existing Israelite oral traditions to help make sense of their ancestry. Although its origins may have come from outside of the Jewish tradition, this story sits within a larger biblical arc, showing how we think about God and how God has been communicated in our traditions over time did not happen in a vacuum. I think it's important to think about the layering of these stories and histories over time because as modern readers, we do the same thing. We also bring the layers of our stories to these texts, which allows us to enter into them in, in seeing this as an ongoing or an unfolding story that we can see ourselves into. You might remember in an earlier part of this story where Jacob, the youngest son of Isaac, takes something that was not his. His older brother and the firstborn twin Esau was the entitled recipient of their father Isaac's blessing. After a long day of hunting, Esau demands that Jacob prepare him a meal before he dies of hunger. In exchange for sustenance, Jacob convinces Esau to give over his birthright blessing. Such a blessing was understood to be not just words, but more like a prophecy for future flourishing and having favor in the eyes of one's family and with God. So this is not some petty sibling squabble that doesn't mean anything. But by the standards of his context, what Jacob did here was wrong and insulting. He took something that was not meant for him 
So in fear and in shame, he flees. Where we meet him in this text selection for today is years later, and Jacob has been on the move now with his own family, probably thinking about how he wronged his brother and his parents. At least I'm willing to give Jacob the benefit of the doubt that he felt some level of remorse about what he did. He knows that eventually he must face his brother Esau. So perhaps Jacob was not only wrestling with some divine being, but he's wrestling with his past and with his conscience. Maybe Jacob is thinking, wow, I really messed up things with my brother Esau. How in the world am I going to make that right? Here in chapter 32, Jacob prepares to meet his brother, but he sends his family and others ahead of him with gifts, hoping that this will make for a smoother greeting after all these years. We see Jacob crossing a river alone, which symbolically might indicate that he's crossing into a threshold space of some kind, a place of unknowns, where under the cover of nighttime darkness, he encounters a divine being, sometimes referred to as an angel or even God in human form. Commentators on this text have noted the ambiguities in the language as to who or what this being is. The Christian tradition has by and large characterized this being as Yahweh, the God of Jacob's ancestors. I don't think that's a poor interpretation of this character. In fact, I do think there are times where it makes sense that we would wrestle with whatever it is the spirit is trying to tell or ask of us. I also think it could be helpful to see this divine being as representing part of Jacob's personal struggle, his struggle with identity and purpose and belonging amidst a difficult exile, which maybe speaks to some of the struggles that we face on a more regular basis. In any case, the text says that Jacob and this being wrestled all night until daybreak, which, whether that's real or metaphorical, suggests that it was a very long and tiresome struggle. When the divine being sees that Jacob is winning the fight, he dislocates Jacob's hip, and he has, from what we hear later, a lasting limp. Through this encounter and struggle, he is physically and permanently marked. Yet regardless of the pain he was probably experiencing, Jacob holds on. He's not ready to let go or to give up on the fight. As he's wrestling, he acts as if he's got it all figured out, that he is in control of the situation. He is indeed a worthy opponent to this angelic adversary. In verse 27, the being says, let go of me. But Jacob tries to bargain his way out of this encounter. He responds, I will not let go unless you bless me. A somewhat familiar request since he bargained with Esau for his blessing in much the same way which makes me wonder if this demand is more of an act of self-preservation rather than pure selfishness or greed. I think Jacob is actually pretty scared because he isn't in much control at all. Remember, he still has to face Esau, and he's not sure if he'll live through that encounter, let alone this one. He stands before this person thing bearing all of who he is, completely vulnerable, knowing that he can't afford to lose. Then the divine being asks for Jacob's name. There's something important in the question, what is your name, that I want us to sit with for a minute. When we first meet people, one of the first questions we might ask to know is that person's name. Our names are identity markers of family histories and cultures and languages, and they can be sources of pride 
or evoke memories of painful pasts. Names can legally change or be adopted and can have new meaning for us as we live life and gather our own experiences. If this being is God, then it's likely that God already knows something about Jacob's history. God probably knows how he tricked Isaac and took Esau's blessing, and God probably knows that Jacob is strong, but is also struggling to reconcile what he did to his brother and to his family. Rather than let Jacob be bound to that narrative, a narrative of shame and guilt, this being offers him a new one in the form of a different name, Israel. Although the narrator of this text continues to refer to Jacob by his birth name, he now has an alternative. He has the choice to live into a new identity with a new calling, different than his previous life. Jacob has been so named and claimed by God, despite past wrongdoings and mistakes. The divine being never discloses their identity to him, but Jacob sees that this struggle with this person thing, and perhaps the struggle with himself, is important enough to name the location of where it took place, acknowledging and honoring it for its place in the wider story and in the wider journey. Part of why I love this text so much is that it's a reminder of how the perceptions of others can trap us into a narrative or an identity that is not true to who we really are. Perhaps there is something in our past, like Jacob, that has defined every part of our lives up to this point. Maybe we have birth names that don't fit our bodies or our personalities anymore. We might have names that carry rich histories that are never told to us out of shame or fear. Or we come from families, social circles, or backgrounds that want certain things from us because of our names and what's associated with them. We get a lot of names, or rather expectations, thrown at us all the time most of which aren't fair or true to our lived experiences. It takes a lot of strength and courage to ignore what those names are saying about who we are. And those names can take the form of bias and prejudice connected to racism, sexism, homophobia, or other fears related to queerness and bodies xenophobia and the fear of others, classism, ageism, ableism. At times, we might internalize those names, and they can hurt us very deeply. The baggage of those names can be so heavy that over time, we start believing them to be true. We might wonder, how can God love me when I am this? Where is God when they called me that? Sometimes it's not enough to shrug off the words and recite the old sticks and stones mantra. Sometimes we accept these harmful scripts that we're given, despite who God tells us we are. If we choose to learn only one thing from Jacob, I hope it's that we learn that God has the ability to give us new names, different from the ones given to us by others. We do not have to accept and live with who or what others tell us we are. And we are certainly not our worst mistakes. I am proud to be a Guzman, though people are sometimes surprised by what I look like if they've read my name before meeting me or make judgments about my name before they see me. I'm proud to have a Mexican father 
and a German mother, to have an Irish first name and a traditionally masculine middle name. I am proud to be a woman, the first in my family of anyone to get a master's degree, and a person who will someday be ordained, having respond to a call while carrying multiple complicated intersecting identities that are often described as both too much and not enough simultaneously. I don't know that I could stand so confidently and say any of those statements six or seven years ago when I first tried to preach on this text. But having been through the last few years of making a way out of what has sometimes felt like no way, I hold the grief and gratitude of having fought so hard to claim a new narrative in my own hands. And that was only possible because I had to constantly be reminded of who I am, what my name is, and why I'm here. It's incredibly significant that both Jacob and the place where he meets this being receive new names. A new name brings with it new possibilities. Israel means one who has striven with beings divine and human. And Peniel means I have seen a divine being face to face, yet my life has been preserved. There is an inherent message of hope here. Despite what was previously, there is now something new because a transformation has happened. The text says Jacob came away from this encounter with a limp, which to some could be seen as a mark of defeat or damage. But this is not a deficiency or a curse that's been put onto him because God wills him to become injured or disabled permanently. And I want to be clear in saying that this is a really tricky part of the story where it could be read that Jacob brought this on himself somehow or that God is punishing him by dislocating his hip. I don't know that that is the point or the key takeaway here. And I want to caution us against that particular reading that this is somehow Jacob's fault because of how easily that line of thinking becomes weaponized against people with disabilities or folks who have to live with lasting injuries or chronic ailments. Rather, I think, symbolically, this experience is meant to remind Jacob that this has been a transformation, that God has named and claimed him as Israel, the one who's, who wrestles with beings and with his being. And living into that new identity might not always be clean or easy, but the wrestling that happened tells us something about who Jacob is. This is a renaming ceremony of sorts because it's a remembering, a bringing back together something that was broken apart of what was and also re-envisioning the possibilities for what could be. Despite Jacob's past slip-ups, this is a story about reconciliation and promise in the people that God sees us to be. If we keep reading in this part of Genesis, we learn that Jacob does eventually meet his brother Esau, and to his surprise, they are still able to share in the bond of siblinghood. Sometimes in order for reconciliation to happen, we have to demand a blessing and to be accepted. It may not always come, but I feel pretty good about saying that we can stand before our peers, our family, society, and the world 
and to demand that we not be subject to the names they give us. I think God will stand with us in that place because God is the one who calls us by our true names. And God will be with us as we wrestle and live into what those true names mean for us. Who we were does not have to define who we are right now. We can't and shouldn't erase the past. We have to face it head on, even when it's really hard to do so. We have to be ready and willing to struggle just a little bit. Whether it's with ideas or new information that shifts our perspective on something, or even if we struggle with people we thought that we knew and they're showing us their true selves now, or if we struggle with our own self-understanding. Growth and change almost always involves a wrestling match of sorts. And that's not an endorsement of the pain or the struggle that's involved. I really don't think that God wants us to have to endure pain or hardship or grief because there's meant to be some kind of lesson in it. I do think our reflections on those hard moments can give us really important insights into who we are and how we handle adversity. There is so much grace coming out of this story, and I think it's a grace that we can know. It's not a theoretical kind of grace, but one that we can feel and believe in and trust. Whatever names you find yourself hearing these days, I pray that they are names that come from God. Names that communicate that you are loved, that you are worthy of peace and happiness, even when you feel most anxious, hurting, troubled, or alone. That you are worthy of reconciliation, despite whatever happened in the past, and that you're worthy of having loving community, which has not gone away just because we can't gather in person quite yet. I'm really hoping that we can be reminded of those things and that we don't need to come away with a dislocated body part to be reminded of that. Amen.
gospel lesson for this Sunday, from the gospel according to Matthew, uh, we read the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus asked the crowds to sit down and take their places and then proceeded with his disciples to satisfy their hunger. And for us today, wherever we find ourselves gathered around a table, we remember that this is a table of plenty. Even when we may feel excluded, Jesus invites us here. When we feel deserted and lonely, Jesus welcomes us and prepares this meal. This is a table of plenty, far beyond the elements that we see. Where the most ordinary harvest of grain and grape becomes a feast that feeds our souls. This is a table of plenty. And so we say, come, all who hunger and thirst to know God more deeply, you are welcome here. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. Holy God, majestic and mystical, author of land and sea and worlds beyond, from chaos you called forth all creation. In thanksgiving we praise you. In thanksgiving we proclaim to all the world, you, O God, are holy. You breathe your life in us from birth to death and beyond. The heavens, the earth, and the seas radiate your glory. The one whom we call your Son shows us a way to your peaceable kingdom. Our very own Spirit. And that Spirit sustains us along our journeys. You, O God, are all in all. As our sacred stories tell us, when Jesus saw that the crowds were hungry in compassion, he yearned to feed them. When his disciples felt helpless in the face of so much need, Jesus trusted in you. Gathering the few loaves, the few fish, he saw in them the unending fullness of your promise. Jesus held them in your presence and asked your blessings upon them, and with that blessing fed the multitudes. In care for your generosity, Jesus gathered the remnants and brought them into your presence to be cherished. In another time and place, at another table, Jesus took grain and grape and fed the generations. You formed the universe in your wisdom and created all things through your presence. You set us in families on the earth to live with you in faith. We praise you for the good gifts of grain and grape and for the table you spread in the world as a sign of love for all peoples. In the spirit of your gracious love and with the confidence born of the faith that we are your children, we are bold to come to this table and bold to offer our prayers, saying the words we have been taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We remember that on the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and friends, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in me, poured out for you. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we reenact God's loving grace to the end of time. Now I invite you where you are to take the bread and pass it around, take the cup and pass it around, and let us commune together. We remember that these are the gifts of God for the whole people of God. And so we respond, thanks be to God. Let us pray. We give you our thanks this day, gracious God, for welcoming us, for receiving us once again here at your table. And though we are physically separated from most all whom we love and hold dear, we know that your spirit connects us And in that we are always one. May we be nourished not only this day, but in all days for the work that you call us to do. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, may we go from this place today, wherever we are in the world, knowing that we have been named and claimed by God, just as Jacob has. No matter our past grievances, no matter our day-to-day activities, may you know the grace and peace of God, a peace that is not insignificant, that is not rushed, it is not half-hearted or foolish, but it is a radically inclusive, welcoming, and loving peace that God invites us to. May you feel and know this peace. Amen.